loading. You're watching the Oxford Clinic Review and the Oxford Silk Road Society co-interview Dr. Mifta Ismail, the former Federal Minister of Finance of Pakistan. I'm Brian Wong, the co-founder of the OPR, and I'm joined by Pratik Joshi, the president of the OSRS. Dr. Mifta, it's an absolute honor and pleasure to have you here with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So I'd like to begin today's interview, Doctor, by examining your current initiative and platform, reimagining packet at possibly a book, if not a series of articles, um, you know, commemorating and delivering the upshot of the discussions that you're convening right now. I was wondering if you could perhaps shed some insight into the core themes of your project, which you co-founded with uh, Shahid Kakan Abassi and Mustafa Nawaz Kakar. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Brian. Uh, in uh, 75 years in Pakistan, we have still not been able to educate a bulk of our population. A majority of children who should be in school, school going age under the age of 16, are still not in school. Uh, World Bank estimates are uh, literacy poverty at 75%, which is to say that 75% of 10 year olds are not able to read age appropriate sentences, two sentences, you know, age appropriate in any language uh, that they feel comfortable in reading. Uh, we have one of the highest growth rate, population growth rates in the world. Our human development indices, indices are closer to, or, or worse than actually in many cases than sub-Saharan African countries, which are much poorer than us, uh, than our South Asian peers, uh, whether it's uh, fertility, whether it's infant mortality, uh, you know, education, health, etc. Uh, so Pakistan is is a very elite oriented, elite run, elite controlled society, country. Uh, and, and of course, in every country of the world, you have elites have a larger share, you know, of the political power, have a larger share of media power, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, and, you know, uh, but in Pakistan, it's just, you know, beyond the pale that uh, so many years have passed and we've not brought in mainstream 90% of Pakistanis who really struggle day in, day out uh, to make ends meet. So now that Pakistan is in several crises, whether it's political crisis or economic crisis or whatnot, uh, we feel that a crisis is an opportunity and that this is an opportunity for Pakistan to uh, right the ship of state, to you know, to put these priorities in order and uh, nothing should be a higher priority than, you know, social justice uh, to ensure that all Pakistanis have some sh decent shot in life. And, uh, and, and we're not, you know, leftists. We are people who believe in free markets and all that stuff. But we really do think that no market can operate efficiently if there, if there is so much discrepancy in the powers of you know, participants. Uh, if somebody is not educated in today's society, um, the free market outcome would not be a very salutary outcome. So we, we feel that reimagining Pakistan is how to restructure Pakistan, how to rethink of the basics of our governance model to A, make it more effective, to make it more inclusive, and as it turns out that because of the elite control in society and because of the you know, con controlling elites in our society, the coalition of controlling elites, our society doesn't go for growth. We are very stagnant in terms of our economic growth. And whereas you've seen Japan, for instance, in the 50s and 60s registering double digit growth um, and Korea in 70s and 80s and, and China in 90s in the first decade of this century. And now India and Bangladesh are growing at 7%. Vietnam has done it. Uh, Pakistan has, is, has not gone onto the growth bandwagon. And that's pr primarily because the status quo favors the elite and they're not really into growth. Because if you're already well off, you know, growth is not so much of a priority for you. More important is to maintenance of the status quo. So you have to somehow bring growth into the equation so that the poor people of Pakistan also get jobs, also get opportunities to get ahead. And that's essentially the, 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 the thinking behind or the motivation behind this reimagining Pakistan platform. 
Thank you so much. And on that note, you know, you've mentioned the problem of elite capture and the ensnarement, essentially, of the existing sort of opportunity or the strangulation, so to speak, of the opportunity structures, the denial of the masses of the ability to access social mobility as a result of the intransigence. I was just wondering, going back to the implementation of the reimagination, you know, we've got three parties currently in Pakistan, PMLN, uh, PTI, PPP, each of them seems to have structural issues. PMLN obviously is reluctant to step up to greater fiscal responsibility today, and the PDI has fallen into disarray in the aftermath of recent events. The PPP also doesn't seem to have the popularity or the interests of the masses at heart. So how can you drive forward the reimagination here, given the political quagmire and also the out-of-touch nature or detachment of the elite? Or do you not see that as being an accurate diagnosis of the status quo? No, I, I think that you're quite accurate in your diagnosis. I mean, I really are. But as I said that, you know, a crisis is an opportunity and this crisis is now a crisis that's also hurting our middle classes. It's probably hurting also our, you know, elites. And whereas other countries have been able to form these coalitions, governing coalitions, you know, between elites who and, and middle classes and others who want growth, you know, China was able to lift millions and millions out of poverty in in in, in a 20 30 years. You know, uh, so if other countries have been able to form such coalitions, it's about time Pakistan also forms a coalition, which uh, will have some sections of the elite, but will also have uh, an opportunity for middle classes and you know even poorer people uh, to move up the economic ladder. And uh, and so uh, look in in this age of social media and and, 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 and and you know other media and stuff um, what we can do is just preach you know uh, to people uh, and and oftentimes when I, we talk about this people are saying you're just repeating the problems which we are obviously you need to repeat the problems and we obviously have some solutions as well uh, but at this point we need people to understand the existing problem and to see it in a way that we are seeing it uh, which is to say that there are forces within the country, within the governing elites of the country, within the governing coalition of the country, who to whom it suits to not move. And then hopefully by dint of political pressure, these political parties would then, you know, either lose out on in, in subsequent elections or will come up with policies that sue for growth, that 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 have an increasing um, inclusive coalitions that that would you know provide growth and opportunities and social justice to the poorest. I think the point you made about the need for coalition is absolutely spot on, and it also you know, reminds us a lot of the discussion that we've been looking at from Stefan Durkon on gambling on development and the need to undertake that developmental gamble as China did in 1980s with reforming opening up or alternatively Indonesia to some extent under Suharto, so on and so forth. But I suppose one question going back to what you said about mass propagation and dissemination of ideas is that in Pakistan, you know, the informational sphere seems to be so captured by entrenched political forces, the party machine, so to speak, the political elite at large, that some would suggest maybe, you know, doctor, what's needed here on your part too is, do we need a new party? Do we need a new party machine to mobilize and rally resources to drive forward the progressive agenda you have in sight and on the table? Or do you see yourself as being able to jump or work across the partisan aisle really in delivering upon your message? So, so there are about a hundred political parties in Pakistan, maybe, you know, I mean, certainly more than, you know, a hundred actually, I think. And, and so for, for me or Shahid Abbasi or Mustafa Nawaz to form another political party is not really going to make a big difference. I mean, you know, what's the difference between 104 and 105, for instance, right? Uh, the idea here is uh, to try to talk to people and to make headway. And, and I would suggest to you that in spite of these political parties having really entrenched political machines and PTI, for instance, was just, you know, uh, awesome in its ability to build narratives based on facts as well as mistruths. Um, and, 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 and had so many, you know, Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts and all that, in spite of all of that, and the other political parties are also entrenched and they, they have a good media machine. Uh, but in spite of all of that, we have got a considerable amount of audience we have been able to make inroads into 
a people's consciousness. The fact that you and I are talking about this today, you, Pratip, and I are talking about this today. The fact that we have done seminars across Pakistan. The fact that uh, you know we are all on social media. The fact that you know we are being trolled by <laughs> many political leaders as well <laughs> suggests to me that we have made inroads. And Shahid Abbasi has been a former prime minister. Mustafa Nawaz has been a senator and a minister. I've been a finance minister twice. I've been a minister of investments, privatization, and all that, and have been a member of Pakistan Muslim League for many years. So it's not like we are voiceless. You know, we are not voiceless people. We are also part of this elite coalition, you know, uh, and have been and are a very privileged individuals in Pakistan, in Pakistan, in government and people of Pakistan Muslim League in my and Shahid Abbasi's case and uh, most People's Party in Mustafa Nawaz's case have bestowed on us some of the highest offices of this land. So, I mean, in that sense, we are very privileged. But the fact is that our privilege then, I think, puts an ethical pressure on us that once we come to this realization that, you know, something needs to give, that we must talk about this and not hang on to our existing positions or try to just get back those positions or get better positions or things like that. That is incredibly fair. Although, as you mentioned, you are obviously in positions of relative privilege. And I suppose one of your you know, critics often cited criticisms directed towards you and also your colleagues is precisely because of this privilege you might come across as aloof or disconnected or disjointed from the masses. Do you fear that that perception of elitism could also hinder you, aside from, you know, obviously generating, as you rightfully know, to the ethical obligations on your part? And if so, what's the best means of overcoming that perceptual gap or, or misalignment, if that's something you're worried about? Look, being from, you know, being, having privileged backgrounds and having privileged offices that we've held in Pakistan gives us a voice, gives us a platform to talk about this. And and, and so uh, that's obviously, I mean, we, we, we enjoy that privilege, and, but we are not, uh, we don't feel entitled in, in the way that many privileged people in Pakistan feel entitled, you know, or elsewhere in the world. And, and, and we are grateful to the Pakistani nation even today that we are out of the office, but there are people who are still listening to us and who are talking to us, engaging with us and criticizing us, critiquing us fairly. Uh, the idea is that, you know, uh, it should be a, you know, we should be able to induct uh, voices which are not necessarily our voices. So when we've gone to Balochistan, which is where we started from Quetta, which is historically the poorest sweep of province in Pakistan, and there are many Baloch nationalists that we gave a platform to who would otherwise not get a platform in front of the former finance minister or prime minister or you know human rights minister. And we listened to them. We disagreed with much of what they said, but we 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 listened to them because they are Pakistanis, just like you know Shahid and I are, or Mustafa and Shahid and I are. And in it is their right to talk to us and our right to respond to them. So we we did this. Shahid and I were in Hyderabad, uh, uh, the second largest city in Sindh. Uh, a few days back, and there again, we were speaking to a lot of Sindhi nationalist intellectuals, people who very eloquent people who made you know cases about their issues. And again, we listened to them and we disagreed with them where we had to disagree with them. But we are giving voices to a lot of people that otherwise do not have platform in Pakistan because we one of the things we feel is that one of the things we need to reduce is a sense of alienation in Pakistan, and that if these political groups just don't talk to each other and just, you know, and, and then they talk to each other only to, to amongst themselves. And so we then have so many echo chambers in Pakistan and there is not much of interaction. So we are bringing voices. We did this in Peshawar also. Uh, we are bringing voices into uh, giving platform to voices that otherwise won't have this mainstream price uh, platform that we have. And we still, I mean, what are we saying? We are saying that, look, you need to have a dialogue, not necessarily with us or not at all with us, but amongst the leaders. I mean, that 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 that, that, that the dominant political forces uh, and, and the dominant institutional forces need to sit down and figure out that, you know, this country has not uh, has not done justice to its people, that this country has not run well. We have not done a good job with this country in running this country. And we consider ourselves to be part of the ruling elite. And we consider that we are, you know, you've been fairly apportioned blame to us. But we now say that, okay, we've done, you know, there are certain issues that we need to solve. And no one group should decide how to solve these group issues because no one group 
has the vision or the capability of doing this or has the sensitivity of doing this. Let's all sit together. We are all Pakistanis. Let us sit together, figure a way out. How do we want to you know, chart a future? And uh, so, so in that sense, I think that, um, you know, uh, we can justify that, you know, even though we are privileged individuals, that we are not using our privilege for, you know, for um, furthering the interests of the elite, but we are actually using our privilege to bring a more inclusive society. Absolutely. And just one last question on this fantastic project of yours, Doctor. Uh, on the behalf of many of our audience members, we're no doubt incredibly curious and interested in what you're working on. Would you be able to put some numbers to this? Very <laughs> Oops, sorry, sorry. Could, could you hear? Sorry, us? Brian. I, I I lost I lost your voice a little bit. Uh, oh, no worries. At said... all. We're just wondering if you could uh, put some numbers on essentially the the quality and the quantity of engagement you've had on social media in terms of the meetings, the gatherings, the many symposia you've had over the past few you know we, months really in terms of your project. Would you be able to put some numbers behind that and just uh, to exemplify to our audience how so, 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 the so, problem? I'll, I'll, I'll... I'll, I'll give you a brief uh, listing of, I mean, we did four big uh, seminars in Karachi, Lahore, uh, Lahore, uh, Peshawar and Quetta. We started with the smallest province, Quetta, uh, Balochistan, capital of Balochistan is Quetta. Then we went to Peshawar in KP. Then we came to Karachi in, uh, in Sindh. And then we came to Lahore in, in, in Punjab. Uh, then, you know, uh, we've done a smaller couple of gatherings in Karachi. We do get, I mean, we did a gathering in Lahore, uh, oh, sorry, in, in Hyderabad. Um, we were supposed to go to Faisalabad, but then some events happened and we couldn't go. But we're going to go to Faisalabad, to Multan, to Kuchranwala and to other smaller cities. I personally have go to a lot of universities. I've gone to universities in Lahore, in Islamabad, in Karachi. I, yesterday, I spoke to a gathering of you know university students and youth in Quetta through Zoom. Uh, so, so my engagement personally with, with the university students is a lot. Uh, Mustafa is a very known human rights champion in Pakistan, and he talks about this, and we tweet about this. We do Facebook, to, you know, special, you know, uh, Facebook sessions, YouTube sessions, and stuff like that. Um, we get you know everywhere we've gotten uh, more people than we expect. Uh, so, so I mean, so, so I mean, if, if, if the, and I would not say that. Uh, I, actually, let me say this: uh, that, that the, the, of the middle classes and the educated classes of Pakistanis who use Twitter and Facebook, I think that reimagining Pakistan is capturing the imagination of those people. And, and, but because we have no political aims, you know, uh, per se, I mean, we would like to bring political change, but not necessarily, you know, ourselves in that, in that, in that paradigm. And especially given so much is happening in Pakistan and the mainstream political scene, but even then we still have a space, you know, uh, that every day, you know, we are invited on TV to talk about this and all that stuff. So I think that we've done quite well uh, in terms of um, the impact we've had. So, uh, Dr. Mifta, what you described uh, in the Pakistani parlance that's known as the technocratic approach. Now, it's a tried and tested, and uh, it has had mixed results. So my two questions, two small questions uh, that are part of a bigger question, which is that one, what you're discussing is a technocratic model. Do you think it will work given the experience Pakistan has had with the technocratic approach? And secondly, you, Mustafa Nawaz Fokar and Shahid Khan Abbasi, uh, the three of you have been known for your statements, which are critical of the party line. And recently, uh, there were some developments on uh, your association with the party. So do you think amidst uh, this this whole uh, background, uh, what you are saying, even though if it is very serious and you have strong concerns, but does it have that resonance given your affiliation and your uh, affiliates' affiliations with, with the parties? And uh, yeah. So, so the fact that I can get two non-Pakistani Oxford scholars, you know, being so up on Pakistani events, you know, 
<laughs> says something about our resumes. Our privilege. Our privilege. Uh, it says something about our resumes. No, uh, Pratik, I would, uh, I would humbly disagree with you that this is not at all a technocratic model. Technocratic model in Pakistan normally means uh, just, you know, uh, carrying forward the, you know, carrying forward the agenda already that exists, you know, and, and just, you know, just doing it better, you know. Uh, uh, so we've had like technocratic prime ministers uh, under martial law when uh, Parvez Musharraf was uh, the martial law leader. Then we had uh, people like Shokat Aziz, obviously, a, you know, city banker and very good banker and smart man. Um, and then we've had technocratic leaders like Hafiz uh, Sheikh uh, and others who've worked within political setups. You know, and, and they've done good jobs, I mean, without a doubt. Uh, but but there was no sense uh, of, of, you know, let's say, overturning the apple cart, if you will, or upsetting the apple cart. I mean, what we are talking about is the fact that the problem in Pakistan is not that, you know, you have lack of competence. Uh, what we're talking about is not that we want you to do things better. What the problem in Pakistan is that the fundamental direction of the state is not correct. So, so you can have the best technocrats in the world, okay? I mean, there are issues with competence. I mean, we, we'll come back to that. We'll come to that. But the issue right now is, uh, and, and, and there is no denying the fact that we need to have competent leaders, but the issue is more than just competence. The issue is that, that even if you had very competent leaders, but if you went in the direction that you're going, you know, you're just going in the wrong direction. So you really need to first rethink your direction, and then you need competence. But right now, to go in the wrong direction and drive the car better would actually force you towards the wrong, you know, uh, wrong uh, places much faster. Uh, I have a question by one of our viewers. But before that, uh, let me ask one question on the IMF negotiations. Uh, so whenever you negotiated with the IMF, uh, can you describe uh, the trade-off which is involved? Because what we often hear is, the IMF has always asked uh, the kind of restructuring they want that goes against the populist politics. Uh, so how has your experience been whenever you spoke to the IMF team? Uh, secondly, is that uh, do you feel that the exit of the US from Afghanistan has directly impacted Pakistan's negotiating capacity with the international financial institutions? And then we move on to our next question. By so, uh we need to go back just a little bit and think, why do we need to go to the IMF? You know, and considering IMF as the way the way, way the international monetary system is set up, you know, what, what is what the, the Bretton Woods architecture, if you will, or, or the Washington consensus, the way this is set up is that in IMF is considered to be the lender of last resort, right? If when nobody lends to you, the IMF lends to you. And IMF lending comes with a bunch of conditionalities, uh, which in IMF view is that, you know, you need to do these things to cut, put your country in the right track. And so then, you know, we, then we will lend to you so that, you know, with our lending and with the right policy prescription, hopefully you'll get out of the quagmire that you're in, which brought you to the IMF in the first place. So but this time when I was negotiating with the IMF, of course, I mean, uh, in April, when we started this, they said we would like to see your budget because they wanted to see a primary surplus in the budget, primary surplus being the total surplus minus uh, total uh, surplus minus the uh, uh, debt servicing. Uh, the IMF also wanted at the, when 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 PADM government came in power and I became finance minister. Uh, Pakistani government at that point was losing seventy rupees per liter of diesel and 50, and forty rupees per liter of uh, pe petrol petrol, and so we were losing about. And since we were selling about a billion liters each every month, we were losing about 110 billion rupees a month. Uh, which, to give you an idea, is three times the cost of running the civilian government of Pakistan. Okay. Um, so, which is also, by the way, 110 billion is, is, is was at, at that point a lot more than our defense expenditure. So, this was not a loss that we could incur and afford. You know, we, I mean, we were going straight to, you know, insolvency. Uh, so we had to obviously the IMF requirement was that you know you stop you know subsidizing diesel and petrol. Um, at that point, we were selling both petrol and diesel cheaper than 
uh, UAE and diesel, I think, cheaper than even Saudi Arabia. And I spoke to the Saudi minister of uh, finance and he told me that, you know, you guys are selling it cheaper than we are. So in that sense, I can you fault IMF for saying to you that please increase, you know, the prices because you can't afford to do this subsidy. That we, you know, you're spending $600 million on subsidies, whereas you want a tranche of $1 billion from the IMF. You are subsidizing petroleum and diesel uh, by 600 million rupees dollars, which means that you will now have to import a lot more because you're selling it at cheaper, you know, prices, and you're selling it in fact at a loss. So you live, your your import bill will therefore also increase. So I mean, all of those things. So IMF is not wrong. Of course, when it says that you know you have to balance the budget or so, show a surplus in, in in the country which is showing eight uh, percent, you know, deficits, and all of a sudden you want to bring it to four percent deficit. Uh, making a 4% adjustment of GDP is very, very difficult in any given year in a political government. I mean, it's just, you know, and especially the last year of the government, you know, uh, last year of the assembly tenure, first year of the PDM government, the coalition government, you know, to make 4% adjustment is not easy. You know, that means you have to tax a lot. You have to cut expenditures. Uh, I mean, lots of things that you have to do. And, you know, when you tax, nobody likes to pay taxes. And, 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 and so... But I have to say that the prime minister was quite uh, uh, ready and willing to make these sacrifices based on, you know, uh, my recommendation, his own understanding, of course, of things. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, you know, but, but, but I've also worked at the IMF and, you know, I, I did my PhD from the same university that the IMF mission chief used to do. So I think we really know the same economics. So, uh, I mean, I understood where they were coming from. You know, I understood what they were saying. I understood also that politically these things were very difficult. You know, that you cannot just raise, even if you're losing money, 70 rupees a liter, you cannot just raise it in one day. It takes a little time and you have to make political space and then do it and all that stuff. And and then during the time also the, the Brent prices kept going up. They were $105, $110. Today they're like $70. So, so you know, and, and, and edible oil prices went up to $1,700 a ton and we bought all the edible oil now again they've come down so a lot there were a lot of headwinds plus the imf program revival of the imf program so so it is it is difficult to make these adjustments and uh, it's painful to make these adjustments the, to the second part of your question is it harder now that the afghans are not or the americans are not in afghanistan i would imagine it is you know i i i, I mean i've dealt with the IMF, but not into a negotiation when I was the finance minister last time. And even then they were talking about devaluing the currency and all that stuff. And Americans were in uh, Afghanistan and, and the previous PTI government also had a very difficult time negotiating with them. So, uh, and, and, and frankly speaking, I thought that all the foreign countries, uh, China, the US, the Middle Eastern countries, the European countries, they were all kind of helpful to us, but perhaps, um, uh, the urgency of their help was not as much as it used to be. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, yeah, but 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 you know, international politics or global politics is what it is. Uh, we have a question from a Pakistani uh, anthropologist, Sonia Gulzeb. Uh, Sonia asks: uh, Pakistan has had respectable per capita growth over the last decade. Why a respectable GDP growth and inflow of money could not be translated into human development at large, which is like a growth without development. And as an anthropologist, she's interested in knowing what is the cultural aspect which could not let people grow. So what was the first part? Pakistan has had a respectable growth or not a respectable growth? Ha a respectable per capita growth. But a lack of HDI growth, so to speak, I suppose. There's a discrepancy between the two. So, 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 I mean, I, I, I would slightly disagree with Sonia there that, I mean, seriously, our growth per capita has been less than respectable. Um, not necessarily because the growth, aggregate growth has been less, but also because our population is really growing very fast. If you believe this census that's now being undertaken, uh, and if the census is right and the previous census is correct, then we are growing at uh, 3%, you know, which is the same as Congo and probably worse than any other country in the world. Uh, even the last census gave us a growth rate of 2.4%, which means that the average Pakistani woman has twice as many children as an average Bangladeshi woman and three times as many as an average uh, Sri Lankan woman, you know. And, and that's just, 
you know, I mean, that's just not sustainable for, for the bigger resources we have. Uh, and, and, and Sonia is absolutely right that HDI numbers are really, really bad. Uh, I, I mean, what is the effect on culture? I don't really know. I'm not an anthropologist, but, uh, but I, would, I, would, I would argue that it drives alienation. It drives resentment. I mean, when there is this Greek tragedy that happened, you know, that of the shores of Greece, you know, and where supposedly the Coast Guard did nothing really much to help uh, all these people drowning. So many of them were Pakistanis, you know. And uh, what drives a man to leave his family and home and, and, and the village or shed city in which he grew up, you know, uh, to try to seek a better future, you know, on, on, on a pirate ship. Uh, you know, can you imagine the economic hardship he and his family must have gone through before he you know, to undertook this very risky journey? So it's, it's you know, I mean, so, uh, you know, the uh, hunger also derives its own, hunger drives its own culture also, or cultural, you know, aspects also. And, 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 and to have so many Pakistanis hungry, to have so many Pakistanis not being able to, you know, meet, you know, and you know, make ends meet, must cannot be really good for our culture. Cannot really be good for uh, social participation. Cannot be good for political participation. And you have alienation. And one of the things you see actually, uh, and this is more political, uh, you know, uh, than anthropological issue, is one of the things you see is, uh, you know. Uh, Pakistanis get gravitating towards religious fundamentalist parties. Although normally when Pakistani elections happen, you know, religious parties, you know, don't really get a lot of vote. They have a very big voice in our political discourse and political decision making, but at, at the ballot box, they've never done well. But uh, there is a party, new party, newly emerged party, TLP, Tariq al Lambak, Pakistan, um, you know, which is now gathering a lot of steam and, and gathering a lot of voters. And, and to me, that's not because people have become religious, you know, but that's because they're alienated from, you know, the existing social order. They're alienated from the existing political order. And then they say, well, check everything out, you know. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, uh, not enough growth and certainly not enough improvement in human development indices has very negative consequences for society. And, and, and that's in, entirely fair. And I want to just shift our conversation onto a slightly different dimension here, which is that during your tenure as finance minister, doctor, uh, there was an interview that you conducted uh, with Becky Anderson at the CNN, which was largely over, you know, amongst other things, uh, Russia and the war in Ukraine right now. And, and as you know, you know, Pakistan has cut an oil deal with Russia quite recently whilst concurrently signing pacts with the United Kingdom to supply rockets to Ukraine alongside other arms at large. I was just wondering, where do you think Pakistan stands on the war in Ukraine? And do you think it's trying to have its cake and eat it? Or do you see it as serving a more nuanced role, really, in trying to hedge across a multitude of sides? Well, first of all, I think we need to note that Pakistan has not violated any sanctions. Uh, there are ships which are under sanctions. Uh, and in the, initially after the war, when the prices had gone up, there were severe sanctions on Russia. And then there was some a deal in the Western capitals where they said that if Russia were to sell, uh, you know, some dollars below the international price that they are allowed to sell. So Pakistan is not in violation of any Western UN or unilateral sanctions. So that's the first thing to note. Um, and that we've not done anything, you know, on the sly or hidden, we've done it in, in, in plain view of the whole world that, okay, um, here's Russia selling oil at a cheaper rate. Uh, we're going to buy this oil. Our refineries are not manufactured or geared towards, you know, uh, processing Russian fuel. We will mix it with some Arab light, Arabian light fuel, and then see uh, what will happen. And we've done it. And, uh, and, and, and we know that uh, this will produce more furnace oil, which has very low market value in Pakistan compared to, for instance, d diesel or petroleum, other petroleum products. Uh, so Pakistan has done that in, in plain view of the world. Uh, look, uh, Pakistan is a very poor and, and, and you know uh, country, and we don't really have the luxury of taking sides on <laughs> in, 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 in global power politics. 
uh, as it is, you know, it's, it's very difficult for us to navigate the relations that we have with, you know, because of the China versus the U.S. thing, which is one of the topics I know that you'll talk about. Uh, so there, I think Pakistan has a long-standing policy as a smaller country compared to India, um, and, and because of our Kashmir, you know, uh, grievances, that we don't think that any country should be allowed to take over the, or violate the territorial integrity of any other country. I mean, that's uh, that's quite clear that we, you know, we, we've maintained that, uh, and 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 the government of Pakistan has decided that you know after making this statement this is where we will let it stand that we don't think that any country should be violating the territorial integrity of any other country that i mean and, and people can draw whatever conclusion they want and that's very fair because i believe the first government to government import of discounted russian crude oil since the war started was conducted using the rmb and as you quite correctly preempted we were going to ask you a question about sino us relations it's just to change the tack here a little bit um, i want to shift the angle perhaps onto the more financial question here you see pakistan is playing a role any role at all in the internationalization of the rmb and a relative decline of the united uh, or the us dollar really as the dominant currency in the world and are there any prospective drawbacks or upsides you see to this sort of adoption of RMB as at least one amongst alternative trading currencies to the USD? Look, whether or not RMB becomes an international reserve currency in the way the dollar is or in the way the British pound used to be depends on Chinese, the size of the Chinese economy, the growth of the Chinese economy and China's influence on the world, you know, economic influence on the world and how stable, you know, R&B is over the years, you know. Uh, one of the reasons uh, Germans had a difficulty leaving the German mark uh, after, uh, you know, and, and, and adopting the EU, adopting the Euro, uh, was because German mark was a very stable currency that, you know, people sort of could rely on. Uh, so we uh, need to be, uh, so, it, I mean, Pakistan is a very small country. I mean, our total reserves are not enough to make a dent in, in, in the international, you know, international trading of RMB or dollars or whatnot. Uh, so whether or not RMB, RMB has become uh, an international currency uh, will really depend on the Chinese, size of the Chinese economy and the growth of the Chinese economy it has nothing to do with whether Pakistan buys or oil or, or, you know, from Russia or let's say edible oil from Indonesia in RMB or Pakistan buys some other stuff, you know, in RMB. Um, you know, that that's really not even relevant uh, to the position that RMB will eventually, you know, occupy a, a, as a global reserve currency or not. Can't hear you. All right. Sorry, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Now, now I can. Now I can. Wonderful. I was just wondering, you know, on that note, because I think when it comes to Sino-Pakistan relations, do you see the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, CPEC, as having stagnated under Imran Khan largely because of the Pakistan side of the factors and the calculus, you know, in, in Pakistan? Or is it more to do with changing domestic headwinds within China that have rendered essentially difficult, it very difficult for Beijing to continually pump money to sustain CPEC as a result of, of course, COVID, but also long-standing Malay concerning SOEs and, you know, ossification within the Chinese economy. Well, what do you, what is your diagnosis of CPEC and its uh, difficulties, shall we say? Okay, uh, Brian, I'm going to just bring the Pakistani perspective to it because I don't really know so much about, uh, you know, the Chinese economy. Uh, China was hugely helpful to Pakistan. In 2013, when CPEC started, when Nawaz Sharif came in power, uh, Pakistan was only producing 12.5 thousand megawatts of power. I mean, that's the, that was the ent entire installed capacity of 14, 15 thousand working feasible installed capacity. Uh, and we were we had power outages of you know 12 hours a day. You know, I mean, really horrible. You know. Uh, so, in, during that five-year period, and, 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 and well, during six, during the next six years, with Chinese help, and not just with Chinese help, but also with other, you know, equipment that we bought from GE and Siemens and all that, 
uh, with, with our own money, uh, we were able to double the production of uh, power from in Pakistan from 24,000, 20, from 12,500 megawatts to 15,000 uh, to 25,000 megawatt hours, you know. And today, I think we can produce about 25, 26,000 megawatt hours of power. China at that point was also helpful in, in making a lot of roads in Pakistan to improve connectivity uh, between different cities. At, the, at that point, when China was willing to write a check for $45 billion for investments of Chinese companies into Pakistan, uh, the total limit of U.S. Exim Bank for American companies to invest in Pakistan was $500 million. And I think the total limit of the EU Exim Bank was about 500 million euros. So whereas no other country was willing to take Pakistan risk or to invest in Pakistan, China did. Now, Pakistan has had difficulty in paying back uh, some of these loans. And China has shown good patience to Pakistan. There was a second part of the CPAC program, which was uh, not just that we will build these infrastructure, you know, roads and bridges and all that, but all, and power plants uh, and, and power lines, but also that we will try to bring some Chinese companies to invest in Pakistan in various uh, investment parks so that they can produce stuff in Pakistan and export to the rest of the world. And when we will get those dollars, we will able be they then able to pay back China for the power plants they set up and stuff like that. Unfortunately, what happened was that whereas we were able to double our power production, we were not able to double our exports. Whereas we were able to double our power production, we were not able to double our industrial output or industrial production. So that our ability to pay the Chinese and others, you know, Pakistani investors uh, who had invested in Pakistan was compromised. So that's the first big problem. And then we were not able to provide a, fees, a, a conducive enough environment and to the Chinese companies to come and invest in Pakistan. So when a Chinese company, whether it's state-owned or not, uh, is thinking of investing, it is not just thinking of Pakistan. It is, it's also has Cambodia and Vietnam in its mind. It has India, Bangladesh and Sri Lanka in its mind. It has Ethiopia and, 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 and other countries in Africa and, you know, Kenya and Africa, you know, Ethiopia in its mind. So, China, I mean, these, you know, investors, global investors have the whole world where they can go. Malaysia, for instance, and other countries. So the question to ask is that was Pakistan able to provide? Yes, we have better relations with China than most other countries that I've named. But was Pakistan able to provide a conducive enough environment to these Chinese companies so that they could justify, you know, investing in Pakistan? And that we would fail to do. And, and, and so now if you want to revive CPAC, in, in, in its true spirit, it cannot just be government to government projects. It cannot be power plants setting up in Pakistan or Chinese companies building roads and train, you know, train tracks in Pakistan. It has to be also Chinese companies investing in Pakistan and then exporting stuff out of Pakistan towards the West, towards the rest of the world. And there Pakistan has failed to attract any foreign investor, not just from China, but other countries. And this is where, again, we have to rethink uh, that what is it that prevents foreigners from investing in Pakistan and where are we going wrong? Because we do have first class roads in Pakistan. We have a reasonably good electricity grid. In fact, more than a reasonably good electricity grid. We have supplies of natural gas, you know, quite reasonably good supplies of natural gas into, you know, into, into, into factories and homes and all that. So why are we not able to get foreign investments in Pakistan? And that is part of you know, reimagining Pakistan that, you know, we have to rethink the way we set up policies so that foreigners think Pakistan is also a viable place to invest in pa invest and export out of Pakistan. You've touched a lot upon the need for domestic institutional reforms and also redressing the shortcomings in what Pakistan currently has to offer or not to international counterparts. Now, in an interview with EFT, the former advisor to Imran Khan, Abdul Razak
Apologies, doctor. Uh, did your Wi-Fi drop off or our Wi-Fi drop off just then? Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, although, I, yes, please go ahead and repeat no. the question. No problem. They were just saying that, you know, uh, Abdul Razak Dawood accused the previous government of doing a bad job in negotiating with China on CPEC, that he, he, he felt that the government was too concessionary, didn't stipulate enough guidelines to protect Pakistani interests, and gave away too much to the Chinese side. And I believe, you know, the government he's speaking of then was really one where you were serving as special assistant to the Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif then during the incubation period for CPEC. What would you say to this line of criticism that I've heard from not just, you know, Abdul Razak Dawood, but also a bunch of advisors to Imran Khan, who seem to accuse essentially your or, or the pre previous government of having done a, a relatively uh, perhaps less than perfunctory job in engaging with China on CPEC? Is it a fair or unfair criticism? Uh, it's a completely unfair criticism. And, and to use a word that uh, Joe Biden likes to use a lot, it's full of malarkey. I mean, it's complete malarkey. Uh, the uh, go back a little bit. The Imran's entire political, Imran Khan's entire political uh, uh, campaign was based on the fact that everybody else but him was corrupt, and and he brought it down very simply that the only problem in Pakistan is corruption, that Nawaz Sharif and Zardari and all these guys are corrupt, and if you remove them and bring me in power, everything else would be fine. So in every deal, he would accuse people of corruption without any basis of fact. So, for instance, I've spent jail time. Uh, Shahid Abbasi and I were in jail. Uh, he was for seven and a half months, me for five months, uh, without even a case registered against us for setting up an LNG terminal, which I today, even today, is the cheapest LNG terminal in the world. So, I mean, if, if we had set up a cheapest terminal in the world, how could it be corrupt? But nonetheless, we were you know, accused without registering a case and we were put in jail. Um, uh, the, the, we made a deal with LNG, with, with Qatar, one of the bestest, by then the cheapest deal, you know, ever. And India, for instance, bought LNG two months after that and was had a more expensive deal. Bangladesh bought LNG at eight or nine months after us, still bought more expensively. And so by then, that was the cheapest deal that Qatar had made. And yet he accused us of corruption. And, and so, if, so if you're accusing us of corruption, then you buy, obviously, you know, vicariously also accusing Qatar of corruption, right? If you are accusing us of corruption, for instance, in the in the terminal deal, which they did, uh, so we had a consultant which was provided, which is a British law firm and a British consultant, which was provided to us by USAID. And they actually had questions against USAID. So, I mean, you know, so look at the conspiracy that, you know, it was not just Shai and me, but it was also USAID involved, you know, a magic circle British law firm involved, uh, a US, some British consultant involved and some other consultants from different countries of the world, I think, including Singapore. So all of these consultants and all of us would have had a conspiracy. I mean, it just, it just defies logic. Every deal that we've made, I mean, has been accused of corruption. So when it comes to CPAC, Imran is accusing of corruption when Mr. Razak Daud, who's a very nice man and a very good man, accused us of corruption. And I think he misspoke. He didn't want to probably speak, you know, but but sometimes people say stuff, you know. Uh, when he did this, a few days later, the chief of army staff of Pakistan had to go to China and sort of, you know, placate that. But they were doing it for domestic audience. But, you know, obviously these things play around the world. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that uh, every power plant that China set up was based on NEPRA pricing. NEPRA is a regulatory agency pricing that was available to every investor in the world. Okay, any investor could have come and invested in Pakistan. It was not the, the Chinese. So if there was something wrong, it was wrong with the you know NEPRA pricing, nothing to do with the Chinese, you know. And and Chinese set up three power plants, you know, initially, which were crucial. And then there were some power plants that the government of Pakistan set up, which was again done by bidding with with you know with G winning two bids, I think three bids and then Siemens winning one bid. Uh, so then you're accusing a lot of other companies of corruption and, and all that stuff. So, I mean, I mean, so, you know, uh, I think that this whole idea of simplifying everything in Pakistan as that any, everything wrong with Pakistan is just corruption and that if you remove corruption, Pakistan will become rich, uh, then turned out not to be true when Imran Khan came, supposedly then there was no corruption. So why did Pakistan not become rich in those five years? Why did Pakistan's you know, borrowing increase so much. 
uh, 80%, 78% of all borrowing in done in the first, uh, Imran Khan's four years borrowed more money, as much money as 78% of the money that was borrowed in the previous 71 years, you know, and the borrowing is continuing even more, even now. Uh, and there are structural reasons why the borrowing is going up. So, so it was his simplification of everything going wrong with Pakistan as being corrupt, as labeling everybody else as corrupt. That was the reason why this was said. But I think that when you say these things, and, and Chinese, some of these Chinese companies, like a road building company that built one of the highways in, in Pakistan, was one of the largest Chinese companies in the world, and companies don't take these things, you know, uh, nicely. Uh, the Qataris were not happy when they were making accusations of, you know, LNG uh, corruption in the LNG deal. Um, and, 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 and after a while, they stopped saying this about the Qatari deal. Then they stopped saying about the Chinese deal. Uh, and, 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 but they still continue to call the rest of Pakistan is corrupt. But they stopped calling the foreigners corrupt. And what you said about corruption there and this fixation upon purging corruption strikes me to be reflective of a zeitgeist, you know, as a sort of political slogan that's been embraced by the likes of Bolsonaro, Donald Trump, and of course, in your country, Imran Khan, to drain the swamp and to purge it of corruption. And yet many of those fervent supporters of this cause you, you, would You have forget to... one leader in, in India and one leader in Philippines also before. Ah. Yes, indeed, indeed, and and I suppose the, the the trick here, you know, for you, or the tricky part here, is that many of these folks who are so fervently and ardently outspoken in favour of them are also those that you would have to engage inevitably for your reimagination projects. Um, but but in any case, the last question I'd like to ask, uh, Doctor, on my part, before passing over to Pratik to conclude today, is that when it comes to the IMF, you've had a rich experience dealing with the IMF, working in the IMF, thinking about the IMF, theorising about it in general. What do you think are the biggest problems when it comes to IMF's approach to Pakistan? And more specifically, how do you think, if at all, Pakistan can play a role in reforming the IMF in a way that's more equitable, more fair and transparent? So it's sort of the, the other side of the table, so to speak, if we can sort of turn the table on you to ask you for your thoughts on that front. Look, there are... Uh seriously good economists, uh, such as Joseph Stiglitz, you know, Nobel laureate, uh, and others, you know, uh, who have critiqued the IMF and, and, and the way that IMF policies have not necessarily helped a growing economy, especially during the Asian contagion, you know, and stuff like that. And there are other economists who have actually answered back those critiques, you know, Ken Rogoff and others. You know. uh, so there's a very healthy debate uh, about this. In, in, in Pakistan's case, uh, we're a chronic patient, you know, and, 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 you know, IMF is not perfect, not close to perfect. IMF doesn't understand politics of Pakistan, you know, now it does quite a bit, but still, you know, and it's not clear to me that all their policies are correct. I mean, I had a serious disagreement with them about, you know, taxing wages, for instance. And I thought that, you know, we should not be having 35% tax on wages. The tax on wages should be much less because wage earners in Pakistan are the only ones who are actually forced to pay tax. Businesses are able to avail, avail, avail and all that. But then IMF takes a macro view. I mean, this was in, in particular, they took a micro view, but normally they take a macro view and they say, well, you know, have give us a surplus. You know, at least a you know primary surplus, uh, or give us this much tax, you know, revenues. Figure out how you want to do it, okay? Uh, and then it's up. It's our job to figure out how to do it, and they they obviously help. Uh, sometimes making large changes in a very short time can give you know wrong shocks. You know, whether it's of inflation, whether of unemployment, you know, economic growth, and all that. That is true. The problem is that IMF is good at dealing with countries a couple of times, you know, so like India, for instance, went in 92, IMF helped it out, whatever. And then from there onwards, India is on its own and it figures out its own policies. But Pakistan and Argentina present a different case to IMF that these are countries which are chronic chronically sick and come back to IMF again and again. So then IMF becomes a very big part of the political discourse, the economic policy making. And, and that's just not right. And it's, IMF is not supposed. Think of this IMF as an emergency room doctor, you know. Uh, 
but you know, we're using this as a GPS, you know, I mean, so, uh, so, so in that sense, I mean, IMF's capability really is as a banker slash economist and not as a, you know, uh, growth economist, development economist, right? Uh, so the idea should be that we go to IMF once. In that three years, we honestly, you know, fulfill those conditions, not because the IMF said this, but because we actually believe that those are the right things to do. Liberalize where we really need to, which is just, you know, make no sense. I mean, you know, I mean, for instance, today, uh, we're making some very fundamental mistakes. I mean, you know, uh, uh, so when you're making these fundamental mistakes, uh, I mean, uh, you can blame the IMF or not blame the IMF, but you know, and then and and, and and if you're bailed out, then you know, then those mistakes survive. As, is that the right thing to do? But what is the choice that IMF has? If you otherwise meet the conditions, it will bail you out, right? So that's it's you know. So, uh, but the thing is really that IMF is not institutionally geared to, uh, you know. What would it's been a very interesting conversation so far and i think what we've learned today really from dr ismail is a wide range of insights on reimagining pakistan but also the implications this has on pakistan's foreign policy domestic economics relationships and bargaining with the imf and more fundamentally really the question of how exactly it is that a country enmeshed in such a quagmire of economic malay and also other developmental difficulties can hopefully chart and map out a path forward. Uh, this is an incredible opportunity for us, and it's been a privilege and an honor for us to have hosted Dr. Mifta Ismail on a part of the Oxford Political Review and the Oxford Silk Road Society. Once again, you've just heard from the editor or the founding editor, Brian Wong, and Pratik, the president of the uh, Oxford Silk Road Society. Thank you all very much for watching today, and we look forward to having you back with us at the next Oxford Political Review and also Oxford Silk Road Society event. Thank you all very much for joining. Thank you.